In this uh, third segment of chapter three, we're going to take a look at what we would like to refer to as measures of distribution shape. Um, and also, because what happened is that we talked about measures of central tendency, we talked about spread. Now, what does the shape of the distribution actually look like? Uh, is it a symmetrical distribution? Is it skewed? Um, this may be something that we want to take a look at, right? So symmetrical, nice bell-shaped curve that we're familiar with, or it could be skewed, highly skewed to the right, or highly skewed uh, to the left. So we're going to look at, um, very briefly, even though it's not something that you'll be tested on, but the measure of skewness. We often talk about a skewed distribution, and so it might be useful to take a look at that. We're not going to do Chebyshev's uh, theorem. We look at Z scores because it's very important for our next chapter. We're going to look at the empirical rule and how we detect outliers. So let's get very quickly to this. All right. So, like I said, even though we are not going to be required to remember this, I think it's useful uh, to just be aware that we can actually measure how skewed the distribution is. In other words, to what extent that distribution is. A, de a deviation from a bell-shaped curve. And we have a measure called the skewness of the distribution. And that's what the formula uh, for that looks like. And um, if we look at this distribution, well, this looks fairly symmetrical. And so therefore, the value of the skewness should be zero. There's no skewness in that data. But if it is skewed to the left, then we should get a negative value for our, skew, um, our skewness because you have these low values sort of bringing the average down, the mean down lower. And what will tend to happen in that case is that the mean would be less than the median. The mean would be less than the median in that case. If we have a distribution that's skewed slightly to the right, then we see we have a positive skewness factor. It's because we have a couple of high values that's moving the data to the right, in which case the median is going to be less than the mean. In other words, the mean will be greater than the median, right? Because the median will be somewhere here, but the mean has been moved up a little bit because of these high values up here. And then here's one that's really skewed, as you could see fair amount on the positive side, and so therefore it's strongly positively skewed. Um, there's another one again. So these are just examples to show you various levels of skewness, all right? Um, this one is for apartment rents, and the previous one, I believe. Um, well, we didn't actually identify a particular data set for that one. Okay. Now let's look at Z scores. What is a Z-score? And I'm really glad that we're actually doing this in Chapter 3 because we come back to it in Chapter 4, which is extremely crucial. Uh, a Z-score is actually a way of measuring the distance that values are from the, the average or the mean, but expressing that distance in standard deviations. So we often refer to it as a standardized measure. Right. standardized measure. So let's um, look at a pictorial representation of what we're talking about. So say we had a data set. And with that data set, we calculated the sample mean, which we would calculate from the sum of the x's over n. And then we calculate the sample standard deviation s. Now, we could do the same for population, but because this is statistics, we are often dealing with samples. So I, I will often, by default, be referring to samples. So as we know, remember I gave you a shortcut formula, and learn it very quickly, SSX over N minus 1, where we know that SSX is the sum of X squared minus the sum of X all squared over n, right? So given that we have a sample mean and a sample standard deviation, remember we could express coefficient of variation and all that sort of good stuff. But if we now look at all of our values, say if we if we plotted 
all the x values that we have we have x1 x2 x3 and you know just assume that our numbers are in ascending order x4 x5 x6 x7 xn the largest value so what if our mean was somewhere around here let's just put it arbitrarily right there so that's x bar so if i took x6 x6 there's a distance between x6 and x bar so that's my x6 so that distance is x6 minus x bar and that's great i could actually do that for all the values because remember how we calculated the standard deviation we took xi minus x bar squared those divide by n minus one and took the square root of that and that gave us s that's what we did but i gave you a shortcut formula now which looks like that so what happens now is that we could measure those distances but those distances really you have some positive values and some negative values they're not standardized what if we divided all of these distances by the standard deviation s so now we're going to measure our distance in standard deviations oh how many standard deviations is x5 from the mean how many standard deviations is x7 from the mean and so now we start speaking a language. It's kind of like almost saying, how far is, um, uh, you know, uh, say Halifax from Truro? 97 miles. So we're using miles as a unit of measure or, or, um, or kilometers, sorry, because we're in Canada, we're dealing with metric, right? So we could use miles, we could use kilometers. So it's kind of the same thing. We could actually express the distance between the values in standard deviations. And so... Um, we call that a Z score. So Z becomes our measure. So how, how many standard deviations is that? So anytime you see a value of Z, Z represents a number of standard deviations that a value is away from the mean. So if my average was 6 and then uh, I have a value of 12, X some random value of 12, and the standard deviation is 3, have an x that's 12 and x bar that's 6 then I could compute a z score my z score would be 12 minus 6 over 3 and that is 6 over 3 which is equal to 2 so this score of 12 is two standard deviations away from the mean it's like saying two miles from the mean or two kilometers from the mean or two feet from the mean so our unit a measure is standard deviations and so we refer to z as a z value or a standard normal but when we come to chapter six we refer to it as a standard normal value all right but for now we're just going to call it a z value which standardizes the distances in terms of a unit of measure and that unit of measure is standard deviations how many standard deviations those values are away from the mean so i hope you get that all right so z scores uh, a measure of relative, of relative location and uh, what happens now is that if your z-score is negative it tells you that the value that you're looking at is less than the mean if the value of the z-score is positive the value that you're looking at is greater than the mean and then if the value is zero then that value happens to be the same as the mean itself all right now one of the things that we are often interested in, and you'll, it will become clearer as we go through the course, we often wonder whether or not the data that we're looking at is from a bell-shaped curve. All right, Is that data from a bell-shaped curve? So if we had lots and lots of values, or if we look at the population, would it be symmetrical? In which case the mean is equal to the median is equal to the mode, right? Wouldn't that be nice if we could get that? Because it has a lot of benefits to it, but later on we'll come to that. So how can we test whether or not um, the data that we're looking at, the sample data, might actually have come from something like this? So this is our sample that we've taken. This is the population. And because we don't have the, all the population bias, we don't know. 
but we have something called an empirical rule where we take a look at the sample and depending on what we see in that sample we might be able to guess what the population shape might look like and that's called empirical rule but empirical rule state is, is as follows that if we actually took the, the sample mean and added one standard deviation to it and subtracted one standard deviation from it then we will have about 68.26 percent 68.26 percent of all the values in that sample fall in, in that range so if i had 100 values i would expect about 68 of them to fall in that range that's the frequency you're counting how many values are in that range it's kind of like similar to when you say range the range is like the ranges that we have in a histogram right if we added and subtracted two standard deviations from the mean then we expect somewhere about 95.44 percent of the values so if we had 100 values in our sample we'd expect about 95 of them to be in that range and then almost all the values almost 100 percent but not quite 99.70 percent of the values in our sample should um, be within three standard deviations of the mean okay so that's if the data came from a bell shape curve that's what we're interested in so the formula should kind of look like this so if we were to take the mean we subtract one standard deviation and add one standard deviation whatever this range turns out to be then when we go back to our data set we count how many values in, our, in that range we should see 68.26 95 and so forth all right and this is not um difficult to do in terms of um the calculation is very straightforward once you've calculated uh, your sample mean x bar and your sample standard deviation s then the first range would just be x bar plus or minus s i'm oh, sorry put that wrong place plus or minus s in other words what we're looking at is x bar minus s to x bar plus s first one second one so the second range then would be x bar plus or minus 2s and in which case that would just be x bar minus 2s to x bar plus 2s and three x bar plus or minus 3s so that would just be x bar minus 3s to x bar plus 3s and of course like i said it's not that hard if we just took some random values what if x bar was say 15 and s was 3. so the first one would be 15 plus or minus 3 so that would give us a range of 12 to 18. so 50 minus 3 is 12 15 plus 3 is 18. second range so 2 3 is 6 so that would be 15 plus or minus 2 times 3 that's your 2s so 6 from 15 gives you 9 6 is 15 21 and then the third range which would be 15 plus or minus 3 times s would be 9 from 6 to 24. so we expect 68 percent of the data to be in that range 95 percent to be in that range and almost 199.72 percent to be in that range all right that's as simple as it gets what a lot of people tend to um, not do properly is that they forget that to do the verification that all they need to do is to put your data in ascending order and then just check to see how many values fall in those in those particular ranges um, sometimes they get confused but these are ranges and you want to get a frequency so the frequency would be how many values fall between 12 and 18 
And if, if say, the number of these values happens to be, I'm just going to just use, say, um, V, number of values, and your sample size is N, then that gives you the percentage or the fraction of the, the sample that fell in that range. All right? How many values fell between 9 and 21? How many values fell between 6 and 24? That's all we just keep doing. And then we're there. Now, we want to detect outliers. If we want to detect outliers um, in a data set, what happens is that because almost all of the data should lie within three standard deviations, then the chances of values falling outside of three standard deviations is actually small. So if you find a value that falls outside of three standard deviations, it is typically considered an outlier, an extreme value. So we use that as our benchmark to determine when we have values that are outliers. So data value for z-score less than um, negative 3 or greater than positive 3 might be considered an outlier. All right? And it could be an incorrectly recorded value, value that was incorrectly included in the data set. A correctly recorded value that belongs in the data set is possible that, yes, while you have this outlier, it belongs there. Because what if you live in a neighborhood where the average price of a house is $250,000, but somebody built a million dollar home? Well, does it not belong? It does belong, but it's an outlier, right? So some outliers are legitimate. Um, so all we need is just a marker to be able to tell us when indeed that we've gone to the extreme end or the deep end, as we would say. And that is what would help us to do that, is to use three standard deviations, okay? The last thing that we want to focus on is what happens when we have two variables. And actually, we could go on to three and four and five variables. But for now, we've been dealing with a single variable, looking at the mean, the standard deviation, the range, the interquartile range, the coefficient of variation, all that stuff. But we are also interested in this course. And, and we're getting an early appreciation for this because it will become very relevant in chapter 14 when we deal with regression. The measures of association between two variables. So in statistics, sometimes we have what we call correlation. And we often, you know, we, we might say there's a correlation between the amount of hours that you study and your GPA. Uh, correlation uh, between, uh, say, um, the sale of ice cream under temperature. The harder it is, the more ice cream gets sold, and vice versa. Or, or if you have a lemonade stand, if it's very cold, nobody's going to buy a lemonade. So there could be um, a relationship between uh, two variables. There's all kinds. For example, interest rates at banks and the price of houses, you know, or, or the number of housing stocks in a particular city would be reflected uh, or somehow related to the interest rate. When interest rates are low, people take loans, they incur mortgages, they buy homes and so forth. So real estate companies are quite happy when the interest rates are low, the borrowing rates are low, because their sales actually go up. Right? So covariance is a measure of linear association between two variables. And we often talk about um, another measure which is called the correlation coefficient. So values of positive covariance between two values would be in that, they, that when one increases, the other one increases. Negative covariance is when one decreases, the other one increases. So for example, when interest rates go down, housing sales go up. That's a negative correlation. When the temperature goes up and ice cream sales go up, that is positive correlation. When the temperature goes down, uh, and the sales of jackets go up and mittens, that's negative correlation between temperature and those sales values. So how we calculate the covariance. Now, your book will give you this formula right here. And um, this is your covariance formula. All right. Now, the same way we have a shortcut formula for regular standard deviation, we do have a shortcut formula for this one right here. So here's what a shortcut formula looks like for covariance. So you may remember that in, um, if, let's take a look at this, right? 
uh, so you can see the similarity. If we were just talking about the standard deviation or the variance, let's look at variance. We know that standard deviation is just a square root. The variance of a single variable x, recall that has what we did was we took x i minus x bar and we squared them and we divided by n minus 1. All right. I could also represent this by x i minus x bar times x i minus x bar. That's squared over n minus 1. But you see, we don't need to put it in the second form because it's, you know, we're just dealing with x. So now that would be s, the variance of x. But if we had two variables now, s, and we're interested in um, s, x, y, or the variance. Now, here's, here's, a, here's a problem I have with your textbook. It uses s squared for variance, but for covariance, it just uses s. And so I don't like that because I think you could get confused. So I'm not going to use this notation that your book is going to use right here. I'm going to, we're going to call this covariance, like C-O-V, X-Y. And there isn't a, a symbol as such. It just it uses S. And I think that that is wrong because it actually confuses person watching. Uh, sorry. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to call it Cov x y so the covariance of x y so we would have x i x bar so in other words we're interested in the distance between x and y x bar and, and x sorry the sample mean for the x's and the um, individual values but then what happened is that the second variable we refer to it as y and when we refer to it as y, so now we are looking at the distance between the y values and their means. So you see, so those, so it's kind of the same way we have two terms here, one, and here's our second term. But because we have two different variables, x and y, x and y, we change the terms a little bit. And then all we need to do now is to divide this by n minus 1. So I just want you to see that they're quite similar. All right? In When we have a single variable, we call it variance. We represent it by s squared. Here, we will call it covariance. All right? And we don't take the square root because sometimes the covariance can be negative. You cannot take the square root of a negative number. So it is always represented at this level right here. Okay? Which is almost like... Uh, order 2, whereas variance of x is order 2, but standard deviation of x is order 1 when we take the square root of the variance. All right. Now, I said to you I was going to give you a shortcut formula. So in much the same way that we have a shortcut formula, I like to show the equivalence between things because I believe that when you see the equivalence between them, it makes it a lot easier to understand. So here we go. You may recall... For variance, what we did, of x, that is, we just um, would do this. S squared is equal to, so because we have x and x, so this becomes x squared. And when we do all the mathematics by expanding that numerator, it boils down to, without me going through the proof of it, We get this value right here divided by n minus 1. And that's a shortcut formula that I gave you. In fact, I gave you SSX. SSX, which means the sum of the squares of x over n minus 1. If I then take the square root of both sides, I have the standard deviation. Well, so instead of multiplying x by x, as we did for variance of x, now we have to multiply x times y for covariance and when we do all of the mathematics behind it then the covariance of x y 
the shortcut formula for it will look like so instead of x times x it will now be x times y make sense so look at that so here is x times x while this one will be x times y and instead of x uh, the sum of x squared we will take the sum of x but we have another variable so instead of the square net would be the sum of y and we divide it by n as well okay and then divide it by n minus 1 so that is the shortcut formula for covariance okay good now I want you to know that what we do is we refer to this numerator right here as SSXY SSXY whereas for the variance of x only we call it SSX all right so sum of squares due to x this is it right here and then this would be sum of squares due to xy let's actually write that down because I want you to note that because that's the formula we're going to use so SSX would be sum of x squared minus sum of x let me write a little clearer here for you sum of x all squared over n I'm just doing the numerator I'm not putting it the whole thing over n minus 1 so sum of x y is sum of x y so we multiply x by y in this case Whereas in, 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 in this case over here, we will multiply x by x. In other words, we square in the x's. And then the sum of the x times the sum of the y. You could put them in brackets over n. And that gives us sum of x, y, SS, SSXY. And last but not least, if we were just interested in y alone, we would, just the same way we could find the variance of the x's, we can find the variance of the y's. So similar, so sum of y squared, sum of y all squared over n. And we refer to that as SSY. So sum of squares x, sum of squares xy, sum of squares y. And we're going to use that to give us our um, what we call correlation coefficient right? so we're going to now introduce a next measure so I've already given you covariance let me just remind you what covariance is in this case so the covariance x y is s s x y over n minus 1 okay just same way we have SSX over N minus 1. And then, of course, when we expand that, we will put sum of X, Y, sum of X times sum of Y over, sorry, over N. Divided by N minus 1. Okay. Now. We have a new measure that we call the correlation coefficient. Correlation coefficient. Correlation coefficient. C I E N T. So the correlation coefficient, if we had all of the x values and all the y values, and so I've been talking about two variables, remember? So temperature, as an example, could be our x, and sales would be our y. Interest rates and housing sales. So that's your x and that's your y. And then, of course, the interaction between the two of them is called x, y. So to get the correlation coefficient, we want to know how are they correlated. Is it negative? If it's negative, it means that when one increases, the other one decreases. And if it's positive, then when one increases, the other one also increases. So to get this measure, we have a population value and a 
sample value. If we have all of the values in the population, it doesn't really change anything. So here's the way in which we actually find this. This correlation coefficient for population, so this is population correlation, is denoted by rho, is given as SSXY. I'm going to use the, so unlike your textbook that uses um, standard deviations and the covariance, I am actually going to use the, I'm actually going to use the SS values that we were working with. SS, my pen just shut off on me. So this SS, X times SSY. That's the population, or standard, or, or if it is, if it is, um, so it's rho, right? If it is population, and then we call it R, if it is sample. The formula does not change. No point in me rewriting the formula because it does not change. Um, all you'd have now is that you'd have capital N instead of small n for population, small n for sample. And I want to mention that the values of R or rho vary between negative 1 and positive 1. So rho would be less than, would be, could, sorry, would be greater than negative 1, but less than positive 1. It varies between those two. And so if things are positively correlated, your R or your rho would be greater than um, 0. And then if it is negatively correlated, is negatively correlated where the values go like this then r or rho will be less than zero they will be negative it will be negative so greater than zero and less than zero if there's no correlation linear correlation between the two variables if we don't see any pattern then it would be zero r would be zero with no pattern where the values are just all over the place. So there's no real pattern. R or rho would be zero. Okay. Let's take a look at the balance of these slides. Just a couple more to show us. So correlation coefficient is a measure of linear association, not necessarily causation. That means it doesn't tell you that one causes the other, but just that if they're kind of related. All right. So we could say that there's a correlation between the number of hours that you study and your grade. But is it necessarily a causal relationship? Well, in other words, that more studying caused you to get a better grade or that it just happened to be positively correlated. Some cases it's causal, some cases it's not. So the formula that like I said that your book uses is this formula right here. If we wanted to understand so that you don't get too confused, uh, I think the better way a book should have done it would be to say that because the S values are standard deviations, they're not SS values like I'm using or like, like I showed you in the last formula. What they should have written would have been covariance X, Y, or that's what they have here right now over standard deviation S of X, S of Y. That's actually what they're using as rho or r, the covariance. But by putting it as s, it really confuses the reader. It certainly confuses me because I'm saying that's not a standard deviation of x and y. It's a covariance. But that is not a symbol for covariance. S is not a symbol for covariance because we separate variance from standard deviation. So why would you be using s? when s represents standard deviation and s squared represents variance. So I think it's a little bit of uh, some confusion there uh, for people. So use the formula that we gave you, which is SSXY over, and you could, it's very easy to prove that the two are the same. You'll trust me, you'll get the same values. SSX, 
times SSY. And please notice there's a difference between SS, which means sum of squares, versus S, which is the standard deviation. All right. So this SX is standard deviation is not the same as this SSX, which is the sum of squares. You need the sum of squares in calculating the standard deviation, but SX is not SSX. So please don't confuse those two things right here. Just to show you again so that you will remember. So S of X will be this, the square root of SSX over n minus 1. So you can see now that Sx cannot be equal to Ssx. All right? So keep that in mind. So that pretty much brings us to the end of this uh, particular chapter. And I think it's time to work some problems. So as I mentioned, correlation values go between negative 1 and positive 1. And so does it closer you are to the extremes, the stronger the relationship. So when you're close to positive one, like 0.9 and 0.95, that's a strong positive relationship. When you're close to negative one, like um, negative point, um, 0.9 or negative 0.85, then you have a strong negative relationship. When you're like negative, you know, 0.1, negative 1.5, these are not strong relationships. So when your values are around the zero, when your values are around the zero, so if this is a, 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 um, a scale right here, and this is positive and negative, if your R values are up here, then you get strong relationships. So there are some up here, strong relationships. But when they're in this zone right here, closer to the zero, the relationship might exist, but it may not be very, it may not be very strong. Okay, so keep that in mind. Good. So do a review on all the things that we've talked about in those three chapters. What is the mean, median and mode, okay, um, quartiles, percentiles. Then we looked at measures of variability, the range, interquartile range, variance, standard deviation, and uh, we look at coefficient of variation. And then, of course, in looking at shape, we look at skewness, but we also look at Z scores that measure for us the distance between the x values and the mean in standard deviations. And then if we have two variables that may have some association, like interest rates and housing sales, uh, or temperature and the sale of mittens and so forth, then we want to measure that as well. And we measure that through a measure called covariance and the correlation coefficient. And we will be coming back to these ideas, the Z scores, the empirical rule, and also correlation coefficient and covariance later on in the course.